So I was, um, I was told that I was going to be talking about uh, education related issues as it pertains to some of the work that we've done at the Department of Attorney General. But if this is a call to action, I'd much rather be uh, spouting some righteous indignation about some of the things that are happening right now. So, I mean, I could talk about our efforts at restorative practices in schools and ending the, you know, pipeline from school to prison and all the rest of it. But um, instead, maybe I'll do this. I just, I don't know what's going on in our country. I don't know what's going on in our state. And, you know, to echo some of the words uh, of Senator Jeremy Moss yesterday, if anyone caught him uh, on yet another one of his tirades against discrimination in the state Senate, um, I am so tired of having prominent members of our state government create wedge issues that don't help us, that don't heal us, but divide us. And that's all they do. And let me, let me say this. Critical race theory is something that I've never heard of before just recently. Uh, and I can tell you as having, you know, two kids that went all the way through the public school system, uh, K through 12, they never heard of it either. Uh, no, it's not a problem for kids who are seeking a good education. Drag queens, okay? Let me say this. Drag queens, not only are they not hurting our kids, drag queens make everything better. Drag queens are fun. Drag queens are entertainment. Um, and you know what I'll say that was totally not poll tested? I say this, a drag queen for every school. That, that is what would be fun for kids and lift them up when they are having emotional issues. But I am just so sick and tired of having marginalized minority members of our communities and of our state be, be used as, as target practice instead of us all coming together and understanding that we need to take all communities in our state and lift them up and not tear them down. And that if we really want to do things like improve education for not just some kids, but all kids, if we want to improve healthcare for not just some people in our state, but all people, if we want to make sure that we have affordable housing for everyone in our state and clean air and clean water, the way to do it is not by hammering already hurting minority communities. It doesn't help anyone. And all it does is divide us and it makes us a worse state and it makes us a worse country. And nobody needs that. So let me say this to you all. How about we just all start working on issues that really impact people together instead of trying to create and fabricate fake issues that are not actually a thing that only divide us and help absolutely no one. Can we maybe do that? Is that something that we can strive for? Sorry, I just had to say those things. Does anybody still wanna hear about our work with the, is that, I mean, we've done a bunch of stuff, but I don't probably have any time left after that. Anu, what do you think? I can go, all right. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm not gonna talk about drag queens at all during the course of this speech. That was written by a staffer who asked me not to speak about drag queens. Um, so in regard to equity in education, you know, I, here's, here's some things that I'd like to say about that. Firstly, when I came into office, uh, I inherited a case that was called Gary B. V. Snyder. It became Gary B. V. Whitmer, I'm sure much to the chagrin uh, of our current governor. But it, my perspective was a little different than my predecessors because I believe that all students have a constitutional right to an education, no matter how poor you are, and no matter how black or brown you are, you have a right to be taught to read 
and write uh, and learn basic mathematics. Uh, schools shouldn't be just a place to house you and house you poorly for a certain number of hours a day. But whether or not there's a constitutional right to an education was the very question that was posed before the United States Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in 2020. Um, and it involved whether or not there should be a requirement of minimally adequate education that gives students foundational literacy. And, and we talked about how important this was for democracy. How do, you, how do you become educated enough to know how to vote if you were never taught how to read? It's a problem. And it erodes our democracy when we don't have a fundamental right to education. So we filed an amicus brief with the court arguing that the Constitution grants a fundamental right to a minimally adequate education that then create, creates foundational literacy uh, and, and that it's an important right for us here in the state of Michigan. Again, better educated residents are aware and able to exercise their rights of citizenship, um, not just voting, but also freedom of speech. And anyone who is deprived of those rights cannot fully participate in their democracy. And those who are able to exercise their constitutional rights then can rise above racial and social economic, um, socioeconomic barriers. And though the court found that literacy, and for the first time in anywhere, in any appellate court in America, that literacy is a basic right, uh, what then ended up happening is that it dismissed uh, our department's petition uh, later on when there was an M bank hearing. So it effectively vacated the lower, the Sixth Circuit three panel ruling because the case was settled. And then on bank, when all the judges heard it, they dismissed it. So it, it didn't serve as precedent. But you know what? I'm, I'm still proud of the fact that we got that ruling in the first place. And I'm proud uh, of the stance that our department took and that there was at least one court in this country that found that the level of deprivation um, that was a catalyst for that lawsuit, the lack of books and missing or unqualified teachers and physically dangerous schools violated these students' constitutional rights in the city of Detroit. And uh, I hope that case stands as an impetus to later inspire future lawsuits challenging the lack of equity in education, just the way that Brown v. Board of Education did. Uh, another area of education where there is a lack of equity in schools is school discipline. And I strongly believe that we need to rethink the ways that discipline is applied to students. And I'm sure we've all seen the data, um, but if not, let me, let me summarize for a minute. Several prominent studies have shown the adverse effects and lifelong impact that exclusionary discipline practices have on students. And there is a clear correlation between exclusionary school discipline and an increased rate of incarceration. And of course, we call that the school to prison pipeline. The connection between school suspension and later involvement in the criminal justice system is a very direct one. And many schools still continue to have zero tolerance rules that mandate exclusionary discipline when researchers um, have referred to this as the criminalization of school discipline. So we have found, and many researchers have found, a direct correlation between the use of restorative practices and a student's GPA. So restorative practice, practi uh, sorry, restorative justice is a practice that emphasizes repairing the harm to the victim and the school community caused by the pupil's misconduct instead of suspension and instead of expulsion. And this can make such an enormous difference to the lives of so many students. Those who have more exposure to restorative justice practices have improved academic achievement and using practices like nonviolent communication, non-judgmental listening, victim and offender mediation and community building circle time. Uh, it helps students manage their emotions. It makes them feel more supported and safe and understood. Uh, and it allows them to have a greater focus on academics. It works. I know it sounds mushy, right? I know there are people who will be listening to this and saying like circle time, what's that? But I've seen it. I've gone all around the state and I've seen schools that have implemented these programming 
And they have so substantially reduced the rates uh, of suspension and expulsion and increased the rates of graduation. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So last year, I led 23 attorneys general in sending a letter to the US Department of Education and Justice to re reissue with 2014 guidelines uh, that had been repealed under the Trump administration that addressed racial disparities in school discipline. And the letter also asked that reissued guidelines be expanded and address the disparate use of discipline against students based on their sex, disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And we issued uh, an op-ed along with NEA President Becky Pringle, who actually came to town and we did a tour of uh, the Lincoln Park School District who has implemented such a program and done an amazing job at it. One of leaders in the nation in Lincoln Park. Um, and you know what we know to be true, of course, is that when you're talking about these positive behavioral practices, they make schools safer. And of course they reduce the disproportionate impact on black students, Hispanic students, AAPI students, indigenous, disabled, LGBTQ kids, all of them. Uh, and so we feel as though if you're talking about the school to prison pipeline, this is one of the most important things that we can possibly do. And especially right now with kids just hurting as much as they are as a result of the pandemic, um, you know, kids are acting out in school more than ever because of it. And we need to be understanding. And, you know, every kid that's disruptive doesn't mean that kid's going to come back to school with an AR-15. You know, some kids are acting out because they're they're hurting inside. And we have to care not just about their, I'm getting the wrap it up sign. Um, we have to not just care about their, I'm sorry, I talked about drag queens for a like, disproportionately long time during the course of, of my speech. But I'm telling you, these restorative practices, I, I'm so hopeful that more and more school districts will see how important they are. Um, we need more social workers. We need more psychologists. We need more therapists. Um, and we need a lot more understanding. Um, also, less guns. How about that? Sorry, I just threw that in. Sorry, I'm, I'm really trying to stick to the script, but this is very hard for me to do, always. Anyway, um, so now that I'm getting the wrap it up sign, I do have a lot more stuff on here, but we are gonna continue to work really hard uh, on systemic forms of, of racism and uh, you know, xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia, you know, the list goes on and on. My department is trying as hard as we possibly can to address these issues in as many ways as we possibly can. But as I stated earlier, it's just not gonna work if we can't all come together and agree on the same basic principles. And, and it, to me, it, it comes down to something so simple and that is just respect. Respect and, uh, for all others and just basic dignity and not looking at every other person as, as an otherism. You know, we are, we're all the same. We all want the same things. We want our, our kids and our grandkids to have all the same opportunities. And we ought to reject hate, no matter who it's levied against, you know? Um, and I really respect what I know so many of you in this room are trying to do. Um, and I just hope that we can um, move forward and make some progress and actually help the people that we are working so hard to try to serve and that we all can see that each and every one of us is entitled to equal dignity and equal protection under the law. So thanks for having me. And, um, and anew, I'm just saying, next time you guys put one of these on, maybe uh, a drag queen for some entertainment in between would be a little fun is all I'm saying. So just saying. It's a good time. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate you having me. Have a great rest of your conference.